Next up, so happy today to have um, my friend. He's become my friend in the last 12 months, um, James Founder, James Porter, I'm sorry. He is the founder of Stop Stress uh, This Minute. And I, like I said, our, our wellness tool, my stress tools. And let me tell you a little bit about James. Um, he is the president of, of StressStop.com a company that has been providing stress management and resilience training and training materials to corporations, hospitals, government agencies, military bases for over 30 years. Now I'll tell you, I met James maybe uh, 10, eight, 10 years ago at a, a wellness conference in San Diego. And that's just what he was doing. He was providing wellness material um, during this conference. Um, his work has been reviewed on major news outlets, including the GMA, Good Morning America, Ladies Home Journal, the Associated Press, and the New York Daily News. Um, his book, Stop Stress This Minute, does that sound familiar? If I have been to your school and I've done sessions on mindfulness or stress management, um, you have that book, Stop Stress um, This Minute. So. He is the author of that. It was published by Wilco. He's, uh, according to this, he sold over 100,000 copies, and it's probably more by, by now, and 6,000 copies to the Mayo Clinic. Um, uh, James is also um, the uh, vendor for our Re Relaxing Through the Season CD that I often give out at conferences and uh, when I'm at schools working with people with mindfulness and stress management. So I'm not gonna delay any longer. Go ahead, James, I know you're in the room and share your presentation with us. We're gonna talk about maximizing mindfulness. All right, great. Hi, hi Rhonda, thanks for um, that great introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen, hopefully, um, uh, somebody will let me know if you can't see uh, the opening screen of my page, page uh, my uh, um, my PowerPoint. <laughs> page Maker is an old uh, graphic design program that went out of style about 20 years ago. Anyway, this is uh, this is PowerPoint. So uh, today we're going to be talking about mindfulness, and uh, hopefully you can see me. I have all these little goodies here. Here's a pine scented pillow. Here is a little flower that I picked today. Let's see if I put it in front of my face. Here are some symbols. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now all of that, I'm gonna work all of that in uh, to the program today. So hopefully we'll have some fun and learn about mindfulness all at the same time. Really be, uh, actually I don't wanna give that away yet. So um, this is a copy of my book that you can see there, my new book. If you if you like Stop Stress This Minute, uh, uh, Maximizing Mindfulness is, uh, you know, this obviously this program today is based on my book. Um, so, and I think Rhonda has, uh, she has digital copies and hard copies. So uh, if you want a copy at the end of the program, if you want to know more, um, by all means, uh, contact Rhonda about that. All right, so let's see if that's forward. Yeah, okay, great. So we're ready to get started. And, you know, we're going to give you some background about why mindfulness is such a hot topic right now. We're going to define mindfulness. I got a three different definitions for you. We're going to share with you the benefits of mindfulness. Obviously, it's kind of important to uh, why would you do it, right, if there weren't any benefits to it. And we're going to show you and explain and really help you understand the difference between formal mindfulness practice and informal practice. I think you're going to fall in love, as I did, with informal mindfulness practice. It's mindfulness you can do all day, every day. Um, then there are, I, I, to really get a grasp a, around everything that mindfulness has to offer, you really need to understand the philosophy behind mindfulness. That's what allows you to live a mindful lifestyle. And I think that more than anything is what, make, what makes mindfulness so popular right now. So we're going to explain these five key concepts that kind of drive the bus of, of the mindfulness philosophy. And we're going to do some mindfulness meditation, of course, it wouldn't be complete without that. We'll do some in the middle of the program, we'll take a little break in the middle and do some mindfulness meditation, and uh, we'll do some at the end. So, so we'll cover all of that in the course of the next 60 minutes. And then at the end, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a demo of, of the new platform that you all have access to called My Stress Tools. 
But let's start with the program on mindfulness. Now, when I was going through my Adobe stock photo library, and I have, I got, there must be like 50,000 different pictures that they give you access to. Um, I, when you type in the word mindfulness, I, I was actually um, disappointed, let's say, with uh, what, what came up. For example, this picture came up. And um, this is um, a pretty much a misrepresentation of what mindfulness is, although I think it's really what a lot of people believe mindfulness is. But mindfulness is not about positive thinking. It's not about planting a cactus. It's absolutely not about uh, cooking bacon and eggs. And I think the whole world thinks it's about cloud gazing, but it absolutely is not. And then when I uh, uh, searched on mindfulness at work, you come up with picture after picture after picture of this ridiculous pose of people in suits and working clothes, you know, sitting on a desk. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. So this is not what mindfulness is about either. And, and, and to me, we're, we're starting to get a picture of what mindfulness is about. Energy flows where attention goes. Um, and, but in, in a way, I, I'm sort of taking a little different view, I think, of this particular passage in the, the, the text here, um, because I think where we are right now is kind of the opposite of mindfulness. It's our, our we're distracted. We've got our, our, our energies going in all different directions because we've got, you know, uh, or we've got our, maybe we're typing a email on our computer and we're texting somebody on our phone and, and maybe even talking to somebody on the phone or in the room at the same time. So energy going in all different directions. Everybody thinks that multitasking is more efficient than single tasking, but that's absolutely not true. Study after study has shown that, you know, every time you switch your attention from one device to the other, it takes a minute or two for you to sort of refocus your attention. And I think You'll agree with me at, at, by the end of this program that mindfulness is about focus. It's about attention. It's about, you know, being the best person you can be in this moment right here, right now. So that's what I think mindfulness is about. And I think this picture tells a better story than all the others do. So let's define what mindfulness is. It's a, a translation of the word sati, which means awareness, attention, and remembering. Or as my mindfulness teacher likes to say, remembering to remember. Um, it involves moment by moment awareness, paying attention on purpose, and it includes non judgment. So, those are all key pieces of the mindfulness puzzle. Here's, here are three different definitions. One offered to us by John Kabat Zinn. You'll be hearing his name a lot during the program. I went on a six day mindfulness retreat with him about 10 years ago. Tim Ryan, if you know anything about uh, the he's a congressman from Ohio. He actually was in the Democratic race for president uh, early on. He dropped out early. But anyway, he was on that retreat as well. Um, so it's uh, John Kabat-Zinn defines mindfulness as non-judgmental awareness. Um, I like to define mindfulness as paying attention to what you're doing while you're doing it. Uh, Eckhart Tolle, if you've read his or heard of his best-selling book, The Power of Now, um, he's been on Oprah a million times. Um, Oprah's in love with Eckhart Tolle, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, he likes to use the word presence. He says, mindfulness implies that the mind is full of thoughts, and he'd rather see us kind of empty the mind of thoughts. So he likes the word presence. So some different choices for you. So now we're going to talk about some of the benefits of mindfulness. And here he is, Mr. Mindfulness. That's according to the Washington Post. This is the guy I went on that six day retreat. Probably one of the smartest people I've ever met. And um, he in 1979, started the first mindfulness center. He actually called it a stress reduction clinic back then. And uh, it was at the Massachusetts Medical Center. He was a um, uh, he was getting a degree from MIT in um, oh molecular biology. It always takes me a little while to pull that one up. And he's he's doing his PhD th thesis or preparing it right. And you, you know you're right near the end. And he attends a lecture that was given by a Zen monk. And it just turned his world upside down. And what he realized at that moment was that he wanted to combine science with this this sort of philosophy that he thought would be really helpful, but he, he wanted that scientific bent that you would have if you were studying molecular biology, he wanted to sort of combine the two, and he did. And that's why we, I think mindfulness is such a, 
uh, buzzword today. So he started the very first mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction clinic, uh, mindfulness MBSR is how we often refer to it, that acronym. And this was, by doing that, he created a standardized program that could be studied, it could be imitated, it could be given by other people other than him. And now as a result of creating this standardized program, it's taught in over 700 hospitals and in lots of corporations. And now it's being taught to you at Mesa. So um, uh, what we know about the benefits of mindfulness is that it lowers anxiety. And this is a result of a lot of the research that John Kabat-Zinn has is, is either done or initiated. Um, it lowers anxiety, alleviates depression, reduces anger episodes, alleviates chronic pain, um, helps people with eating disorders, um, boosts the immune system, and helps cancer patients cope better with their treatment. And what I tell people is, hey, if you've got a, um, either a mental health problem or, a, or any kind Kind of a health problem. Google mindfulness and that problem. There's so many different studies and there's so many different ways that mindfulness can help. So um, I like to um, just dwell a minute on the immune system. It's such a hot topic right now with the, with the coronavirus and everything. And uh, just to explain what John Kabat Zinn, what John Kabat Zinn did exactly in terms of bringing the science. So he was asked to put on a, a, the eight week program at a high tech company in Boston. So he goes in and he recruits 50 people to be in the program. 25 get put on the waiting list and 25 go through the program. So the 20, at the end of the first program, the end of the first eight weeks, everybody, all 50 people got a flu shot, right? And guess what? The people who went through the eight week program had a much stronger immune system reaction than the people who hadn't gone through the program. So they had their immune system boosted by engaging in this simple eight week program. All right, so that's where we, that's where the science for this comes from. Also comes from the work of Richard Davidson. He's a professor at the University of Wisconsin um, at, at Madison. And he's done a lot of research. He's brought meditators from all around the world to come to his lab and he puts them in the MRI machine and, uh, and either looks at the, you know, they create brain scans that, and he either looks at the brains of people who have already meditated or in the case of Tibetan monks who he's brought over, obviously uh, most Tibetan monks are actually in India, not Tibet. And, um, uh, and he, and, and they, by the way, meditated for, you know, years and years and years, usually 10,000 hours. So they're the elite athletes of meditation. And when he puts them in the MRI machine, he asks them to meditate on and off 90 seconds at a time. I guess he rings a little bell, they meditate, and then they stop. And he said, when he's looking at the live images of their brain scan, I guess that's an fMRI, um, he's able to, he says the change between how their brain looks when they're meditating versus how it looks when they're not, he says it's like the difference between night and day. But he's even able to see changes in the brains of people who have come in and who have just are beginning meditators who've only done eight weeks. So as a result of what John Kabat-Zinn has done and what uh, Richard Davidson has done, there are now over a thousand peer-reviewed studies. These are studies that have been published in medical journals and psychological journals that uh, you know verify the, um, the fact that this is an evidence-based practice, which is really important. Now, one of the coolest things to come out of of all this re research is the difference between state changes and trait changes. And I think state changes are the reason people initially get into meditation. They want to feel good. They want to feel happy. They want to feel blissful. They want to feel at ease. But trait changes, to me, that's where the money is. Because trait changes are the physical changes that take place, the structural changes that take place in the brain as the result of having a meditation practice in place as little as eight weeks, for example. And Sarah Lazar, who's a professor at Harvard, is spearheading that research. And what she's found when she puts people into an MRI machine is that there's a very slight but measurable increase in the gray matter in the prefrontal cortex. That's the area right here be, behind the forehead. And, um, and you can see it in the slide in the sort of the purple area. And um, so that's the, considered the executive center of the brain. That's the part of the brain that helps control emotions. And that's one of the benefits of mindfulness is that we gain emotional control by practicing 
mindfulness meditation. Um, there's also an increase in gray matter in the hippocampus as the result of just a minimum of eight weeks of mindfulness. And the hippocampus, you can sort of see right there in the middle of the brain, it's labeled, sort of looks like a big old sock there. And that area, which increases with meditation, decreases in size and is actually decimated by people who have Alzheimer's disease. So pretty interesting contrast there. And then there's a decreasing gray matter in the amygdala. Now, why do you think you'd want to de decrease? Why would that be a benefit of mindfulness? Well, the amygdala is where the stress response begins and it it's originates in the amygdala. And the bigger, the more stress we're exposed to, the larger it gets. And the larger it gets, the more um, sensitive we are to stress. So if you can reverse that process, you will be less sensitive to stress. So this is a really important slide, difference between state changes and trait changes. So now let's talk about everyday mindfulness practice. I think this really blew my mind when I first got exposed to this idea that you could kind of practice mindfulness all day long through every day. So uh, uh, I think you'll believe it after we get through a couple more slides. So before I launch into information about mindfulness, I think one of the things about mindfulness that sort of, uh, I don't know, um, I think it's a little like, like, well, let me, let me just get you involved here in the program. So in your chat feature, I'd like you to um, perhaps just write Whatever you think of when you hear the word mindfulness, what is it that comes to mind? Now, hopefully I'm, I'll be able to see the chat feature. Um, maybe if I click on more, I'll be able to see the chat. So what, what is it that, um, just type anything, word or two, presence, being aware, focusing, observation, focus, zen, quiet, ignoring distractions. Um, breathe, um, all really good answers. Relaxed, personal awareness, calmness, being clear. Yeah, so a lot of people are tuned into what mindfulness is. Um, and um, usually the first thing that comes up is, uh, thank you everybody, I'm gonna click out of that for now so I can see my screen. And, um, th and thank you for all that. Um, so I think for some people it's like, okay, present moment now, well, what is, What's so important about that? What's what, Why would we want to be in the present moment? And wouldn't there be a downside? Aren't there times when we don't want to be in the present moment? Like when we're sitting in a dentist chair or when we're um, you know, planning a party, you're, you're planning a wedding reception and you don't want Uncle Bob to sit next to Cousin Sue because you know they come from opposite ends of the political spectrum and there'd be kind of a disaster at the table. So there are times when we want to leave the present moment and think about the future. But as you'll see, as we work our way through the program, that's a, that's a, that's leaving the present moment on purpose. Remember I said paying attention on purpose was the definition, but um, also it's okay to leave the present moment when you do it on purpose, but when you do it by accident, then there can be some problems. And I think we'll see it in this list. Imagine you're driving your car like I did about a couple of weeks ago. I was heading to the Sherwin-Williams paint store. Now, it just happens to be across, right across the street from the supermarket that I go to maybe once or twice a week. So I get in my car, I head to what I think is going to be the Sherwin-Williams store, but I end up in the parking lot of the supermarket. I even start to get out of the car. And then I say, wait a minute, Porter, you're not going to the supermarket, you're going to the grocery store. So as you probably can relate to, we, we can drive a piece of heavy equipment without even thinking about it. It's pretty re remarkable. Or how about when you park your car at the mall and you come back two hours later, you have no idea where you parked it. Or maybe you've been in your room, you realize you need a pair of scissors from the kitchen or some other little implement or tool. But by the time you get to the kitchen, you have no idea why you're standing there. You're looking around the kitchen, you open up the refrigerator door, you realize, hey, I'm not hungry, um, why did I come down here? And then you have to go back to your room to figure it out. So any repetitive task we can do on autopilot, whether it's ironing or mowing the lawn or filing or crossing the street and, you know, not many, I mean, I know we're 
very, very, I still file papers. Uh, I still file my bills in different um, folders. And let me tell you something, if you misfile a bill, in other words, if you're trying to do it mindlessly, which you can, and you misfile, you put it one, you'll never find that piece of paper, never. And it's probably the same electronically, really, if you don't file it in the place where you need to find it. So it starts to give you a clue as to what the importance of being in the present moment is. Less errors, less accidents, more efficient, right? So, uh, so let's keep going. Um, there we go. So when I first encountered the subject of mindfulness, it was over 25 years ago. I was reading a book by an author named Thich Nhat Hanh. He's a Zen monk. Um, he actually left Vietnam right at the end of the Vietnam War when all the boat people were leaving and uh, moved to France. Um, just went back to Vietnam for the first time about a year ago. I think he's like 90 now. But anyway, when I first read one of his books, I, I think I was just reading a passage from it. He was talking about doing the dishes mindfully. And he was saying that you needed to smell the soap and hear the sound of the scrub brush swirling around in the pot and, and feel the hot water on the back of your hand. And, you know, when I read that, it was very poetic and sort of inspiring, but I thought, isn't there something better to think about than the dishes? I mean, what's up with that? So I completely rejected mindfulness and took me about 20 years to come back to it. So that was a long time ago, but in the chat feature, I want you to just sort of postulate why would it be important to think about doing the dishes? Any, any little phrase that you want to type in, I'll really appreciate it. So let me open up the chat and see what you guys come up with. because you're not worrying about something else. Um, gives your brain a break. Uh, don't miss a dirty spot. Yeah, you get the dishes clean um, or you'll get sick. I love that. Um, uh, and living in every moment, um, satisfaction, appreciation, all really good answers. And it's the first time, by the way, I wish I could, you know, I don't, I don't know how to scroll backwards, but uh, whoever said the first answer I read that you got it right. You all got it right. Everybody's right. But um, uh, it's, you, nobody, I often, I love the answer because you get the dishes clean. And that is really the best answer in one way. But the answer that I'm always looking for is where does your mind go if it's not thinking about doing the dishes? Does it go to a happy place? Do we think this guy is thinking about, you know, just how great his wife is or uh, how great, uh, you know, his kids are, or how they're always coming by and how well behaved they are, or whatever, you know? No, the mind tends to latch onto problems, right? And not in a way that helps you solve them it's usually in a way that makes them worse um, and it's in a repetitive dysfunctional way so when you think about doing the dishes versus where your mind goes when you're not thinking about it and somebody said that right at the beginning can't remember exactly how you worded it but you nailed it um what, what, what the alternative to thinking about where your mind just goes when it goes off somewhere at random. Now, my best uh, or my favorite illustration of this is uh, when you're in the shower, right? You've been in the shower and apparently this happens more with men with our short hair, but you've been in the shower maybe 10, 15 minutes and you have no idea whether you shampooed your hair or not. And so now you, it's just fascinating, right? So let's say you did shampoo your hair and, um, but you weren't there when you were shampooing your hair, You're, you were somewhere else, but your body was in the shower. That's really where your life is, but you're off somewhere else. Now this happened to me uh, a couple of weeks ago. I went to see the dentist for the first time since the pandemic started. I had an appointment scheduled like two weeks before the pandemic or not, I guess I scheduled it two weeks before the, I think it was March, right? When it really hit big time here in Connecticut anyway. And, uh, and so I canceled that appointment. So I knew I was like two years overdue. So I'm standing in the shower and I'm starting to think, oh my goodness, what's gonna happen when I go to the dentist? I was a little worried, I'm double vaccinated now. So I'm very proud of that, but um, I was worried about the dentist and uh, it being right in my face. And, you know, I mean, a whole bunch of different things, not the least of which was, what if he finds a cavity? What if I have to get a root canal? Now I've never had a root canal before, but there I am in the shower where I could be thoroughly enjoying myself. And I'm thinking about, 
what it might be like to get a root canal. Now, you know, the body believes what the mind conceives. So I'm thinking, as I'm thinking about getting a root canal, as I'm imagining getting a root canal, my blood pressure is going up, my heart rate is going up, my muscles are getting intense, and I could be having a wonderfully relaxing time. But instead, I'm exposing myself to stress completely of my own device, of, of my own creation. I mean, it's incredible, really, when you think about it. So the key takeaway from here is that when we go forward in time and we, when we leave the present moment and go forward, we get anxious, we get worried. When we leave the present moment and go backward, that's when we get ourselves angry. We start replaying something that happened, already happened, maybe an argument that you had with your spouse. I can't believe she said that to me. I, the nerve. Um, and so now you're replaying this thing in this dysfunctional way, and it's going round and round in your head, right? When you could be thoroughly enjoying yourself. So remember I said, I think you're really going to like everyday mindfulness practice because there are all these opportunities to just relax and enjoy yourself, as you will see throughout your day. Um, And, and we'll get in. I just thought we'd take a little break here uh, from all this talk and, and just look at these pictures. And, and, and I want you to tell me, are, are these people, and we're going to use the chat feature again, are these people in the present moment or have they left the present moment? So let's just say yes, if they're in or no, if they've left. So what do you think? Looking at the faces in this picture, um, oh, I've got to open up the chat feature so I can see. Um, there we go. Um, somebody says left, um, no. So no means they've left the present moment. Um, yes means they're in the present moment. So um, daydreaming, okay, yes, yes, no, no. Um, yes, taking notes, yes, yes, yes. Okay, more yeses. Um, as I look at them, I think they're in the present moment. Now I do, well, before the pandemic, I used to do lectures all the time in person. And let me tell you something, when you're in the front of the room doing the lecture, you know when people are there and when they're gone. And I always point that out. I, do, I don't call out any individuals, but I say, hey, I know who's here with me right now and I know who's gone. And if I was standing in that room, I think I'd see, uh, I would say that everybody was there with me with, the, with what I was teaching. So it's a pretty interesting thing. It's pretty obvious, um, but let's, let's move on. Let's take another picture and see what you think here. In or out, uh, or I think we said yes is in the in the present moment and no is having left the present moment. So let's um, open up the chat. Daydreaming, no, 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 no. Varied, no. So mostly no, I agree with that. Um, she could be thinking about a problem that's in the test. If you look around the room, everybody else is totally, you know, uh, focused on the test itself. So um, let me close that up, move to the next slide. And what do we have here? So are these people in, have they, are they in the present moment? Yes, or left the present moment? No. So yes or no, um, in the present moment? left the present moment. No, 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 no. And I, uh, yeah, everybody's pretty consistent. You know, um, we all know the phones are a distraction. And uh, when you bring the phone to the dinner table or what, what this looks like the breakfast table, it's, um, I think a good mindfulness practice. If you just want to um, be more mindful and be more in the moment, um, it would be a good rule just not to bring your phone to the table. Um, I leave mine in my back pocket and it, I turn it off and I don't know if somebody's trying to reach me. Now, here's the next slide. Um, I've still got the uh, chat up. So what do we have here? Uh, yes would be in the present moment and no would be having left. Now, to me, no way. That <laughs> I love this picture. Because, and the reason I love it is that pasta dish looks really good to me. And, and she's basically missing out. Remember, your life is going on in the present moment. So she's not really gone. Nope, I, lo I lo love the creativity in just a one word response. Thank you for that, everybody. Um, so yeah, I mean, she's, her life is here in, the, in this room and yet, you know, she's not there. She's, she's off in, in, in phone land. Um, so let's see, let me get rid of the chat. And I think that's it for the, that little series of pictures. 
So, so what we've been looking at is this idea of everyday mindfulness practice or informal mindfulness practice, basically one and the same, the two things. So um, uh, there are many, many opportunities throughout your day to practice everyday mindfulness. So you can be present in conversations, even small ones. Um, they say you have two ears and one mouth for a reason, because you need to listen twice as much as you speak. And when you listen intently, you will always come into the present moment. And the reason I'm doing this funny way of speaking is Eckhart Tolle says, that's a great way to come into the present moment. Listen to the silences in between the words, helps you focus on the present moment more. Um, noticing sense perceptions, let's do that right now. If you're comfortable, and by the way, whenever we do a mindfulness exercise, um, you can close your eyes or you can, um, leave them open. So you always have that option, but I'm going to close my eyes and just notice uh, we're going to, the way to come into the present moment is through sense perception. So um, John Kabat-Zinn wrote a book called Coming to Our Senses. So uh, that's all that the five senses are a way to come into the present moment. And we'll see that in the five, four, three, two, one exercise in a moment. But for now, now let's just notice how it feels to be sitting in the chair. Where's your body touching the chair? Now I want you to notice how the, it feels where your clothes are touching your skin. Just, just take, take note of that. And now notice how it feels where your skin is exposed to the air. Maybe there's a little breeze in the room that you can feel or some air moving around. And that's just something you can do in one minute to be more mindful, to bring yourself into the present moment that you know, if you're feeling a little anxious, do that. A lot of therapists will do that with patients who are who are getting anxious within their therapy. Um, uh, and then, of course, being mindful outside. It's just uh, nature is a great place to just you want to even if you're just walking from one building to another, um, just look at a look at the sky or look at a tree and just connect with it just for a moment. And then there's this five, four, three, two, one meditation. So five, look around your room right now. And maybe there's five, I'm sure there's at least five things that you can see. That's why we choose that number five. I'm, I can see my phone. I can see my uh, desktop computer. I can see some old, uh, I have a couple of old cassette tapes on top of that computer. So just look around and you have to name the thing. Look around, name five things. Now, maybe you want to touch four things. Okay, maybe you want to pick up, I could pick up my symbols, but they would make a loud noise. Um, so that, that's, the, um, that's the four. The three is um, here. Maybe you can hear, I can hear the sound of my computer. I can hear a train off in the distance. What do you hear? What three things do you hear? Identify them. Then maybe there's two things that you can smell. Now, if you remember, I said I had some little goodies here. This is my pine scented pillow. Oh. That is fantastic. You've got to get one of these things. They can't be that expensive. Somebody gave it to me. I love it. Then I even picked this little lily of the valley. They, they come in bloom. Let's see, I'll put it in front of my face. They come in bloom for two weeks in my garden, and I pick one every day. That is the most incredible smell. If you have one of these things in your garden, oh, my God, that is good. So just, and of course, aromatherapy, you can buy aromatherapy bottles. And there's actually some research that shows that it, really does work to help relieve stress. So let's see, we did the five, four, three. Oh, we didn't do, we did, what did we do? Uh, two is smell, one is taste. So you know what? This is a good chance for me to take a drink of water. You can too. Ah, that's good. Maybe you've got something better than water to taste. I hope so. So anyway, there you go. Just little things like that. Can, that's everyday mindfulness practice. Really cool. Um, be mindful while you're eating. We saw those pictures of people eating and they weren't being very mindful. It's just an opportunity to do this on the fly throughout your day. You don't have to take time out to do this. 
And then finally spending time with pets. Pets don't have the big prefrontal cortex that we do. I believe they have a little tiny one and uh, it doesn't allow them to leave the present moment. You know, like we need to have imagination to think of, you know, what might happen tomorrow or the next day. And yeah, that's helped us create amazing things and write amazing things and uh, do artwork, but it doesn't really help us with stress so much because we're always thinking about what, what might happen. So when you spend time with pets, they're always in the present moment. You know, you can reprimand your dog one minute and really within less than a minute, he's wagging his tail because you're patting him and they just, all they know is the present moment. So it kind of brings you into the present moment as well. All right, so um, now we're gonna just give you a little taste of formal mindfulness practice. And I, before I do that, I just wanna see where we are with the time. Good, good, we're moving along. Um, so um, let me go. So. One of the things that John Kabat-Zinn said on the retreat that I attended, it kind of blew my mind, was he said, sometimes our bodies arrive before our mind does. And it's, it really speaks to everything we've been talking about so far. And he said, on the first night of the retreat, he said, probably a lot of you are still home. Your, your head is home. You're, you're thinking about, did I leave the, did I turn the lights off? Did I turn the heat down? Did I leave the key hidden for the person that's going to take care of my cat? Did I put out enough cat food? You know, we're, we don't always arrive at places when our bodies do. So in order to make that happen, every time you meditate, I would suggest that you take at least three or four deep breaths. So let's do that now. Now I have a lot of instructions for just one deep breath. I want you to breathe in deeply, put your hand over your belly, notice that your hand will rise on the in breath, fall on the out breath. Also, I want you to breathe in through your nose and out through your partially closed mouth. And with each breath, I want you to concentrate on getting it to be deeper and bigger and fuller. And by the third breath, you should feel your shoulders rise when you're taking a full deep breath. And you can even press down on your belly as you do your exhale. So let's do that now. Let's take three or four deep breaths, breathing in through the nose and out through your partially closed mouth. Breathing in through the nose. And out through your partially closed mouth, really extending the exhale. And one more, breathing in through the nose. And let it all out through your partially closed mouth. So this is known as centering. We always want to do a little centering before we do a mindfulness meditation. All right. So all we're going to do is what's known as a breath awareness exercise. And this is so simple, you won't believe how simple it is. You're going to learn how to do mindfulness meditation in really one minute. You're, and all you have to do is notice every in-breath, notice every out-breath, and then notice the gap between the out-breath and the next in-breath. And that's it. That's all there is to mindfulness meditation. Now, um, you won't be doing deep breathing. You just notice your regular breathing. We tend to take about a breath every six seconds. So you can play with the gap, right? You can make it longer, make it shorter, wait till your body really wants to breathe. That will keep your attention on your breathing. You know, breathing is kind of amazing. It's, it's automatic if we don't think about it. And yet we can have control over it if we want to. So it's a pretty interesting, it's one of the few things in the nervous system that we can control and it will also function automatically. And by the way, over the course of 24 hours, you take about anywhere between 15 and 18,000 breaths. So um, pretty amazing thing. All right, so let's, let's do a mindfulness breath awareness exercise. So notice your in breath and you can close your eyes or maybe leave your eyes half closed. The Tibetan monks believe that They'd rather have their eyes partially open than close their eyes and be open to your imagination, which they think is really a lot more distracting than just kind of staring at a blank place on the floor. All right, so here we go. We're going to, um, if you feel comfortable, you're going to close your eyes and notice the in-breath. It's just normal in-breath. Notice the out-breath. And notice the gap between the out-breath and the next in-breath. Notice the in-breath. Notice the out-breath. And notice the gap. Notice the in-breath. 
Notice the out breath and notice the gap. Notice the in breath. Notice the out breath and notice the gap. And if your mind wanders, just bring it back to your focus, noticing the in-breath, the out-breath, and the gap. And whenever you're ready, open your eyes. So there we go. We just You just learned how to do a mindfulness meditation. Congratulations. Um, so um, that's really all there is to it. Uh, you may have noticed when we, you know, when I went silent, maybe your mind wandered. Mind wandering is very much a part of the process for beginning meditators, for advanced meditators. Do not please be discouraged by mind wandering. It happens to everybody. And for a lot of people, they feel like, okay, that means I don't know how to meditate. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Mind wandering is absolutely part of the process. And one of the things John Kabat-Zinn said that I remember to this day is the minute you realize your mind has wandered, you're back in the present moment. So you can almost use that like a tool. I definitely did for the first couple of years of meditation because I'd just be lost it in the middle of a meditation. I think, oh, well, now I've done it. <laughs> and then, but I, but it was helpful to know that I was back in the present moment. So I promised you um, that I would talk a little bit about the philosophy of mindfulness. And um, uh, I, I think that will really kind of add to your enjoyment of mindfulness and your understanding. Obviously, it will uh, contribute to that. Uh, uh, and, and, to, and, and it will really help you live a, 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 a mindful lifestyle. I really think this will help. So let me tick off these um, five things and then we'll go into a little more detail on each one. One, you don't have to believe everything you think. Two, cultivate an awareness below the level of thinking. Three, practice non judgment. Four, accept what is and can't be changed. And five, take a moment by moment view of life rather than a narrative view of life. So that's, um, you'll understand that more when we move on. So um, here's a bumper stick that I saw on a car about six months after I did that mindfulness retreat. And I thought, wow, this really sums up a lot of what I've learned about mindfulness so far. And, um, and I want to explain how that works. And I think you'll understand it in the next slide. Oh, by the way, I, I saw John Kabat-Zinn on a YouTube video ex referring to this bumper sticker. Now, as I think I said it earlier, you know, John Kabat-Zinn is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And he said, my bumper sticker, if I had one, would say, I don't believe practically anything, I think. Now, think about that. Here's a guy who's brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and he's willing to say that he doesn't believe what he thinks. Gives you a little something to think about. Now, I, I think we'll understand why that is in a moment. So um, one of the things we often say in mindfulness is thoughts are not facts. Let me repeat that. Thoughts are not facts. They just come and go. The mind likes to spin out these little yarns and it does it all the time. And yet when we hear it ourselves say this, we think it's real. We wouldn't believe it if somebody else said it to us, but you know, um, and we'd never say it to somebody else. But when we think it, it's almost like it's just real. So when you hear yourself say, I'm a terrible parent, or I'm no good at anything, or, you know, I've even heard, I've been out golfing, and a guy will say, I'm a terrible golfer, but he's like, he gets a really low score. So, you know, it's just, it's completely untrue. Now, my favorite um, uh, example of this is, you know, you go to, uh, maybe you park in an airport parking lot, or, you go to a big sporting event and you're parking in this huge parking lot and you come back to where you believe your car is. And when you don't see it, what's the first thing that goes through your mind? You come right to the place where you're convinced the car should be and you go, it's not here. It's been stolen, right? Well, I've had that thought maybe a hundred times over the years and my car's never been stolen. So now you start to see, well, maybe it does make sense to not believe everything you think. Sure, we can use our minds to create incredible things. But the way that all the mindfulness folks like to 
talk about it is use the mind as a tool. It's don't, don't let it use you as a tool. I just came up with that second part. <laughs> so most thinking is repetitive and dysfunctional. It really is. I, I've heard Eckhart Tolle thinks it's like 80% of all thinking. I mean, that's amazing because the mind is just, it's almost, it's almost like in free fall mode all the time unless we lock into really focusing. And that's what mindfulness is all about. It's about teaching you how to focus and not letting, you know, one of the things that a lot of people do is they, they hold grudges. They don't let go of old arguments. Maybe you've heard the uh, old expression, uh, um, when you hold on to a grudge, it's like taking poison every day, hoping somebody else is going to die. So this is the kind of stuff that happens with what Eckhart Tolle likes to call the thinking mind. And Cultivating an awareness below the level of thought is absolutely crucial to understanding how to get the most out of mindfulness. So maybe you have a thought like this rain is so depressing and a lot of people just kind of become the thought, right? So, and then maybe it grows into why does this always happen on my day off, right? So you're thinking like that, but we can learn to kind of notice our thinking, to be aware of it, to watch it. This is referred to as med metacognition, thinking about your thinking. Albert Ellis, who is one of the founders of cognitive behavioral therapy said mankind is the only animal that can think about his thinking and that's an incredible ability and you and it comes in handy when you have these overly negative thoughts that just aren't true so she recognizes that and she says hey i always get a bit depressed on my rainy day because she's cultivating an awareness but she's able to look at her thinking and then she says that's just my thinking mind spinning out an overly negative thought there's lots of things i can do it's not going to spoil my day i'll do some knitting or there's a project i wanted to do around the house this will be a perfect day for it so you start to see that this little bit of distance sometimes it's psychologists call it distanciation really comes to the rescue when you start having one of these depressing thoughts all right, so judgment, practicing non-judgment, it's really helpful to understand how often we're judging everything around us, whether it's the length of your neighbor's grass or uh, the music that they're playing upstairs in the apartment upstairs, whatever it might be. One of the things that you'll see that you judge when you try to do some meditation is you'll say you're no good at meditating. And that'll just pop right out. And then you, because I said, don't judge, you'll say, oh, there I go judging again. So you'll judge the judging. So it's really, um, it's, um, it's really, it's just so omnipresent. It's everywhere. Marcus Aurelius, who was emperor of Rome, but also a, a, a world renowned uh, uh, philosopher wrote that if you are pained by external things, it is not these things that disturb you, but your own judgment about them. So really keep that in mind. And it helps to kind of um, be more in the moment because if you, that you can't be in the present moment unless you accept everything that the present moment delivers. So this nice young couple, um, obviously have just seen it's amazing what a story a picture can tell um they've obviously just gotten into an argument and they're disagreeing on something and um how do you move past that well you know i've been married for over 30 years um i think it's 35 my wife would kill me if i said that but I'm pretty sure it's 35. <laughs> you kind of lose track after a while. And uh, I, I, I was actually attending the National Wellness Conference 15 years ago, maybe 20. And somebody at the conference said that seven out of 10 marital arguments never get resolved. And that was actually very comforting to me because I, I realized it was true, at least in my case. And so all of a sudden I said, well, I'm just normal, right? So, but how do you move past that when, when that happens? What do you do? Well, the present moment can deliver you out of these moments of consternation. If you look, if you look at this picture, they're obviously sitting on a park bench. They're obviously in what looks like a beautiful park. Well, you know, one of them could just say, well, let's just walk around. And then you start to take in the breeze, the fresh air. I mean, they're, they're in shirt sleeves, so it must be just a perfect day, right? So you just take in the present moment and let it heal you. Let it move you past the moment where you had the difficulty. And that's what moment by moment um, uh, 
a moment by moment view of life, right? Most people take a narrative view. They hold on to things that happened a week ago or a month ago. That guy, he said a nasty thing to me a year ago and I'm never talking to him again. But you know, in the moment, everybody says, makes mistakes and says things they don't mean and and bosses are in bad moods but then they're even good bosses let's say or can be in a bad mood a toxic bosses is, is the exception to this rule but um but you know a good boss who is in a bad mood you just have to let that go and let the moment like if the person is being fine in the moment that's the moment that you should be acknowledging um, and it, it, it empowers you when you do that. It helps you move forward in life. It helps you um, be in control of, of your life. All right. So that's the, let me just check the time, make sure we go. Good. We got time for our meditation and time for me to give you the demo. All right. So before we launch into a little short meditation practice, I want to dispel some more myths about meditation here again plugged into my Adobe stock footage or my Adobe stock photo library, um, mindfulness at work, and I'll come up with this ridiculous picture of a guy meditating on a desk with his hands in a mudra position, um, which by the way, I've been meditating for years and barely ever do that. And I've ever, barely, barely ever seen other people do that. So I don't know why every single picture on Adobe stock in the Adobe stock footage library has people doing that. every single picture, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of pictures. It's just a complete misrepresentation of mindfulness. You can see I'm kind of getting up on my pedestal here. So uh, I've got to take a deep breath. Um, so you don't have to close your eyes. You don't have to sit with your legs crossed. You absolutely don't have to sit on your desk at work. Um, you don't have to sit on the floor. You can sit up in a chair. You can lie down and meditate as long as you don't fall asleep. You don't have to have your fingers in these mudra positions and you don't need to have a mantra. That's transcendental meditation. And even if you get agitated, that's okay. Mindfulness is all about accepting what the present moment delivers. So if all of a sudden you just sort of feeling anxious, when you can accept that, you kind of put bubble wrap around the anxious anxiety, you'll see, and it just kind of by accepting it by being okay with it, you'll suddenly see that it'll just pop like a little soap bubble. Um, so let's do a little, uh, we've done the breath awareness, um, thought watching is just sitting and meditating and just watching every thought that comes into your mind. And that can really help you with this concept of distanciation and cultivating awareness below the level of thinking. So absolutely keep that in mind. But we're, we're not going to do that. We're just going to do a sonic meditation or listening to the sounds in the room. I love when it's raining, listening to rain on the roof. It's kind of windy here in Connecticut where I am. And uh, I can hear the wind outside. Uh, you know, I remember when John Kabat-Zinn on the 16th day retreat he came in with the day we did this meditation he opened all the windows it was november it was cold he gave everybody blankets and um i was like what what's he opening the windows for but we could hear a brook it was in a we were in upstate new york and in the catskills and you could hear a brook in the distance you could hear the birds it was really lovely so any natural sounds that you can cue into those are the best like it's sitting next to a brook it's like so easy to do this kind of meditation but right now all i can hear mainly is the sound of my computer so we're just going to shut down for a second not turn off the video or anything but you know just just take note of maybe you want to close your eyes leave them half closed or you leave them wide open and just notice what are you hearing in the room like i say i can hear the breeze, I can hear my computer. What do you hear?
So when I was on that retreat, every time we would come to the end of a meditation, John Kabat-Zinn had these little symbols that looked just like this. I guess you can only see one of them, but I have two of them. And because uh, they sort of blend in with maybe, oh, there, if I put it from my shirt, and he would ring them three times. There we go. So that's our little mindfulness uh, sound meditation. All right, we've got a couple more slides, I think. Um, yeah, we basically did this already. And uh, yeah, so we're get, getting down to the last two slides. So um, every time your mind wanders, this is a big concern. A lot of people give up on mindfulness meditation because they, the, right if they, at, at, at the beginning, their mind is going to wander all over the place. So then you start passing judgment and you say, I'm no good at this. I you know, meant to be a meditator. But every time your mind wanders, that's an opportunity to practice mindfulness. It's an opportunity because as you bring your mind back from whatever it is you've been distracted by, you're strengthening the muscle of concentration, just like as if you were doing reps at the gym. So just keep that in mind. You want, <laughs> the, more, the more distracted you are, the more practice you're going to get at mindfulness. And even if you pass judgment, practice not judging the judging, right? So you judge, oh, I'm terrible, but don't judge that. Just let it be. Let Accept what the present moment delivers, and then you will be a mindfulness master. So that's pretty much everything I wanted to say. We've talked about mindfulness and mindlessness and the difference between the two and how it just sort of helps to understand mindlessness um, to, so that we can understand mindfulness even better. Remember, we talked about trade effects and state effects. Trade effects are you know, the structural changes that take place in the brain as a result of having just an eight-week practice in place. We talked about the difference between everyday mindfulness practice and, and formal mindfulness practice and how you can really be doing mindfulness all day long. If any, you know, single tasking, think about that. Just make a point of, of taking on some little project and just do it for an hour or half an hour where you just turn off your phone, just focus on one thing. You will be practicing mindfulness, everyday mindfulness when you do that. And then finally, if you find yourself in a bind and you're up in the middle of the night worrying, just ask yourself this question. You can pretty much put this into any situation, almost any situation. How am I doing right now? Well, right now I'm in bed, it's warm, totally safe, I'm worried about tomorrow, but right now I'm doing just fine. So that's kind of a little bit of a mindfulness hack you can kind of take with you um, uh, wherever you go. So um, that concludes my program. Um, we have a few minutes. I'm, uh, I know Rhonda wanted me to uh, do a little quick demo of the My Stress Tools website. So I'm going to stop the share and that's going to help me get to the web platform. And uh, give me one second. Uh, hopefully it's still running. There it is. Share the program. Now for our Mesa members, you will log in from my Mesa portal. So you'll go to mesa.org. And under my Mesa, you'll log in um, to our portal with your personal credentials. And from there, you will navigate that platform to My Stress Tools. It's, if you're going from your um, personal computer, it's on the left side, um, and you'll see it there. OK, thank you, Rhonda. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen. And there is my homepage. Every single one of you will get your own homepage. It'll say, welcome, Bob, or welcome, Rhonda, or welcome, Leslie. Um, so. Uh, on this homepage, there'll be information here that's just for you. This will, is a real graph of the various times that you take the stress profiler. If you remember, that's the stress assessment that Rhonda was trying to encourage everybody to go on and take. It only takes about 15 minutes to go through it. So you'll see your scores. This is, I let everybody come on my version of the site. So there's lots of different times people have taken the test. It's also gonna keep track of the number of journal entries you make. Now, I really want to encourage you to keep 
keep a log or a journal of your stress, every little stressful thing that happens to you for about a week or two, and you will find out so much information and that information will lead to problem solving. So for example, I, when I did this 10 years ago, I noticed I'd experienced stress at the bank, the grocery store and the DMV. And what was cool about just the little notes that I was taking is that I was doing the same thing in all three of those places. Now, can you guess what I was doing? Bank, grocery store, the DMV? I was waiting in line. Now, you see, it wasn't those places that was causing me stress. It was the fact that I was there when they were busy. So that led to a solution. So if you use our journaling feature, which I'm going to show you in one minute, um, it can help you lead to solutions as well. Um, on this homepage, you'll find uh, COVID resources. What's really cool, there are seasonal articles, but I think the coolest feature we have going on this now is, um, and this is brand new, just because we want to make you guys happy, we, we made this active and it's really a great thing. As the as the site gets to know you, and as you take the profile, it's going to suggest different resources for you to, to check out. And there's tons and tons of different work resources. But this gives you kind of a roadmap as to what you need to check out, what you need to know more about. All right, so that's the home page. Now, when you want to navigate around here, um, you're going to click on the menu button, OK? So all these little icons here, and my uh, friend of mine likes to call this the millennials page. Um, I, I love icons too, though, and I'm a boomer. So um, it obviously isn't just for millennials, but I thought that was a kind of a clever remark. Um, so, uh, and, and thank you millennials for, for giving birth to icons. I love them, I love them. Anyway, um, uh, so here's the stretch profiler. If you wanna take the stretch profile, it takes about 15 minutes. You can just click on that. Here's the journaling feature. I'll just make a little journal entry and show you what that looks like. Um, let's see if I want to add an entry, you could do, you, you can use this on your phone. So, uh, your smartphone, obviously, uh, not your flip phone. Um, I'm going to just write what I always do got stuck. My computer is up high because of, you know, like I want to be eye level with the camera, but it makes it really hard to type got stuck in traffic. All right. So then I just hit enter. Um, any little simple notation like that is good enough. Um, uh, and that would be an example of time pressure. And then I go down and I save it and it will be instantly saved into my log as it will be in yours. And so I can see if I want to go down, um, I want to show you this thing we call the circle graphs. So you can keep track of the good things that happen to you, but if you're keeping track of your stress, um, it will start to categorize where your stress is coming from. Now, time pressure is a major source of stress and it's really easy to solve. You just need to build in extra time for things that take longer than you think. Like I, oh, when I have a big deadline, I make my deadline the day before it's due, not the day that it's due. Um, so you can solve time pressure if that winds up being a big stressor. Maybe disorganization is a big stressor for you. And that is huge, something that you can really focus on. And you'll see as you keep this journal or log of your stress. So that's the uh, journaling feature. In brain training, you can um, you can learn about how your thinking affects your experience of stress. In videos, we've got relaxation videos, training videos. Um, I think this relaxation video section is really cool. You can kind of go any place in the country. We tried to cover the top 10 national parks. I think we got nine out of the 10 national parks from Yosemite to um, Acadia National Park in Maine. Um, and you just click on it, watch the what you see, this beautiful imagery of nature and, and soothing music. You can click on things. Maybe you like botanical gardens. We've, we've gone to the uh, St. Louis Botanical Gardens and the Chicago Botanical Gardens. And, and they're just, beautiful. just spending like five minutes there and just totally relaxed. So that's uh, part of the... Um, video section. In the audio section, there are just relaxation audios. Let's say you do have a hard time meditating. Go to the uh, audio section, listen to A Day Away from Stress. Really easy to meditate. Webinars on all kinds of topics. But in, in, and we try to be really current with this. So you'll see that um, I think we have a lot of uh, things on COVID and, and dealing with the stress of COVID. So are we staying current there? Um, we have podcasts you can listen to. We have experts that we've interviewed and they uh, answer questions like you'll um, 
we interviewed Raquel Garcon. So if you like when you hear Raquel, you can hear more of what she has to say there. Um, and uh, this is where my book is. If you want to do a deep dive and have me guide you through that book. Um, now, the Resilience Coach, the Wellness Coach, and the Mindfulness Minute are all um, things you can do in two minutes a day, every day for a month. So if you want to just learn about resilience in a very simple, really easy, uh, how should I say, behavior changing way, definitely check out these. I love uh, Michael Arlosky. He's a, uh, he's a professional, I mean, he, he's a wellness coach, but he teaches other people how to be a coach. So you can go through week by week and and learn that there. So that's pretty much everything. Um, Rhonda, I see you there. Um, why don't you take it yeah, from here? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was that was good. You were right. You, it didn't take you much to explore that thoroughly. Now, I want to encourage you, you can do this for your personal mental wellness and help you to master stress. I like to use stress mastery instead of stress management. You can use this personally. Now, for those of you who are working on a worksite wellness program, trying to think of different uh, programs and activities, now I want you to envision using this, especially if you have a group that's all Mesa, all your employed people, all your colleagues have Mesa, so they um, have access to this portal. Imagine doing a resilience challenge using the resilience coach. You can set up a challenge where you all are going in there each day and doing an activity. You can uh, set up a campaign like I'm doing with you and have everyone just go in and do the stress profiler because uh, uh, the issue with any type of healthy behavior or starting a journey um, towards health is awareness. A lot of us are not aware that we are having a little cortisol issue. We're not managing our stress very good. And I'm a poster child of that this morning. Well, the stress profiler is a way for you to go in and answer some questions and you get feedback, you get a number on where you are as far as stress goes and you're able to then go throughout the tool, use some of the interventions and strategies, perhaps come back 30 days later and take that stress profiler again and you might get a better number, okay? So do me a favor, if you like me, if you're my friend, I need you to go in and the, log into my stress tools and use it, but definitely do the profiler email me verification. You'll get a little certificate that you um, got it done and we're going to enter you in the raffle. And look, I'm going to look at my calendar right now. You know, I love to improvise stuff. So we're thinking about this right now. You have until May 14th to go in there and get that done. May 14th. Everybody say May 14th. May 14th. Make sure you get the email to me. Let me know you went in and took the profile. And by that time, you probably um, can tell me that you've done some webinars, you've done some yoga, and you've done some podcasts. But I, I want you to do the stress profiler, and we're going to enter you for some great prizes. I'm excited. Listen, help me feel better about this. In the chat, tell me what you think about it, if it's good. Give me some comments about <laughs> what you think about my stress tools. And it looks like awesome, Melissa. I thank you for that. I think it's awesome. You got to use it to find out, okay? I want you to really explore this. I'll tell you, you already know this, but if we Google the CDC and some other health statistics, mental illness is like an epidemic right now, and it's on the rise, okay? And we know that stress, chronic stress, uncontrolled stress leads to mental illness, things like depression and anxiety. So this makes so we're very concerned about you. So we want to bring on as much as possible and uh, uh, as many products and tools and benefits to help our members manage stress, help you um, get a hold of things. Of course, we have our online doctor visits where you can get um, appointments with therapists and psychiatrists, but this is kind of a preventative approach, managing our stress, a preventative approach. So definitely get on there and give it a try, okay? It looks like it's time for a break. Am I right? 11.07, we have a break until 11.15. We're gonna bring um, Dr. Garzon on at 11.15, so get up stress, turn on your music, do some dance, whatever you do, wiggle, whatever you do. Now, the next break we do, we're going to definitely get up and move. So if you don't have on your gym shoes, if you need to put on some workout clothes or a t-shirt, make sure you put it on because the next break, we're going to move a little. We're going to do some exercise. We're going to do a little toning, just a couple minutes just to get our circulation going before we end this thing. So thank you so much. Go ahead and take that break. I'll see you at 1115.